Welcome to another edition of Capital View. I'm Jack Titchener, sitting in for Jennifer Fuller this week. Our guests are Dave McKinney of WBEZ, Chicago Public Radio, and Peter Hancock of Capital News, Illinois. Gentlemen, uh, good to have you on the program. Lots to unpack here this week uh, at both the state and the federal levels. Let's start uh, at the federal level. Uh, the, uh, the governor and lieutenant governor were in Washington this week uh, uh, talking on different issues. Let's start with uh, Lieutenant Governor uh, Juliana Stratton. She was one of the panelists testifying before the U.S. Senate Jud Judiciary Committee on access to abortion this week. She told the panel that Illinois is now an island for reproductive rights and Illinois needs federal support to deal with the expected numbers of women coming to Illinois seeking abortions and other health care. You know, we've talked in the past about uh, how Illinois' status as one of the only states in the Midwest still protecting access to abortion. How does uh, the Lieutenant Governor's uh, uh, appearance there perhaps uh, elevate or, or change that in, in, in your view? Dave, you want to start off? Well, I mean, I think she's throwing down a marker on, on the state's behalf and, and, and putting it on record. It, it's obvious to anybody on either side of the abortion movement that there are uh, states just like Illinois that are, are you know, the, the, the points at which many, many, many young women and, and girls are, are coming to for abortions. And, you know, I don't think that, um, you know, the lieutenant governor of the state of Illinois is persuasive of a figure as she can be. You know, it's really going to move the needle very much at the legislative level uh, in, in Washington on this. Uh, Congress is, doesn't appear uh, at all interested in, in, in legislating on this. I mean, there will be uh, there will be some effort here in Illinois to deal with that. We know that, you know, even, uh, you know, after the, the, the ruling came down, uh, the governor said that there was going to be a special session here. And of course, that got put off uh, after the Highland Park shooting and, and uh it's going to be, uh, you know, coming up here in a matter of months. But I mean, I think there will be more action taken to, as she pointed out in her testimony, to protect, um, you know, women and girls who come here from out of state from uh, legal repercussions, as well as the clinics themselves and the doctors and, and staff that work at them um, and, and fortifying them in some way, because they're, they're certainly all going to become targets of the anti-abortion movement. Peter? Yeah, I thought one of the interesting things that she said uh, when clinics and hospitals have generally a geographic area, a catchment area from which they draw patients. Abortion clinics in Illinois are now drawing patients from as far away as Louisiana and Texas and Florida. Um, so as Dave was saying, I mean, Illinois is going to be a reproductive health care provider to a much larger territory. And so that's why she and the governor are pushing for additional federal aid. Uh, we will note that Planned Parenthood of Illinois and Planned Parenthood of Wisconsin are announcing uh, kind of a partnership to make sure that uh, people in Wisconsin will be able uh, to get abortion services. So yeah, Illinois is an outlier in the Midwest right now, and it's gonna put a lot of strain on the healthcare system. Um, she, as you pointed out, Peter, she she asked uh, the Biden administration for more money uh, moving forward to support the demand of additional uh, women coming to the state for uh, reproductive health care services and to create kind of a, a centralized hub for providers and patients that would uh, uh, more or less ease the uh, burden on the current providers. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure what that centralized hub is going to look like. I think that needs to be fleshed out a little bit. Uh, but as Dave was pointing out, we are probably going to have a special session uh, before the fall veto session, uh, probably before the election, uh, in which uh, the state will deal with it, with abortion rights and as well as uh, gun issues, I'm afraid. Along those lines, uh, Dave, you indicated that it's uh, it may be several more weeks or, or maybe a month or more uh, to get that special session together. I know they were having some problems 
pulling all the uh, lawmakers together, particularly in the House, it's always uh, kind of a challenge to do that, particularly in the summer months, especially when it's an election year. Uh, I think there was also some concern on the parts of some of the players like Planned Parenthood that they wanted to make sure that they got all of the things that uh, they wanted and get it all tied off before uh, they came back to Springfield, not to do a rush job. But would that be your view? Yeah, most certainly. I mean, I think that, that you know, the Planned Parenthood people, uh, the, the abortion rights uh, people, ACLU, they, they all are working in tandem to try to, you know, pull something together here, pull a package together uh, on top of, of, you know, the, the very favorable uh, abortion rights climate that exists here. So, I mean, that's definitely happening. But, you know, there's also a political dynamic at play here that, that um, you know, people are not as tuned in to news in general, I don't think, during the summer. And, and with an election coming in November, I think that there probably are strategic reasons that, that Democrats would like to, you know, stage all of this a little closer to the election because, you know, right after, uh, right after Stratton's testimony, I mean, uh, the, the Pritzker campaign debuted a new uh, ad that, that featured her and her daughters and, and uh, talking about the importance of abortion rights. And on the flip side, you have Darren Bailey, who uh, is an ardent uh, foe of abortion, but I, I get a sense that, you know, in his case, he's trying to, you know, I, I think, I, I don't know that, that a real heated argument uh, on abortion helps him in a general election, because I, I think the majority of the electorate in Illinois favors abortion rights, and he's probably out of step with that a little bit. So I think, you know, it, it, there, there are a lot of political dynamics at play here about, you um, you know, timing and, and and making sure voters are aware that that this matters. Suburban women are such a key constituency to the election, to Democrats in general, and and you know they above all, I think, are the people that that uh, the Democrats are are aiming to reach here. Peter, what do, what do you think? Well, you know, I I also think there's another factor out there uh, that uh, <clears throat> probably gives them an incentive to put this issue off until just before the election. And that is that inflation is now running at 9.1%. Yeah. Um, that is going to be devastating to Democratic candidates on the ballot, um, especially people running for Congress. Uh, so their ability to change the conversation and focus on something uh, other than inflation and the price of gasoline and the economy uh, plays to their favor. I was just watching uh, a new CNN poll on that and all the issues that you were talking about. Inflation is at the top of it and abortion is down at the bottom of that list of, of concerns. Uh, I want to turn now to the issue of gun violence. Governor Pritzker and Highland Park Mayor Nancy Rotering were in Washington this week uh, for the signing of the Safer Communities Act. President Biden had praise for both uh, uh, of them in their response to the Highland Park shooting on July 4th. Pritzker says he supports more changes to Illinois' red flag law, uh, but will those changes make a difference when it comes down to preventing further Highland Park uh, shooting tragedies? Well, I think the real issue, uh, obviously there are some weaknesses to the red flag law, and I'm not sure how much more you can strengthen it. I think the real issue that they're going to be focusing on is an assault weapons ban. Um, and Pritzker talked about this in Washington. Uh, the president talked about it. Uh, and, you know, the idea that people, you know, civilians can walk around with weapons that are more powerful than those used by law enforcement. Uh, I, I think that's the issue they're going to be focusing on. Um, with respect to that, uh, and, uh, a ban on assault, wife, uh, assault rifles, how would that square with federal law? Because Congress uh, doesn't seem to have any appetite for going after that at all. Well, yeah, I don't think there's going to be any kind of uh, probably no movement on that uh, in, in Washington. Uh, it, you know, it'll it'll put Illinois uh, in, a, in a spot that, you know, there are other states that, that ban the sale of uh, AR-15s and the ammunition magazines that go along with it. Um, you know, to, to your original question, Jack, about will, will all of this have any impact? Um, I, I think you can legislate and legislate and legislate, 
uh, in, in making these things unavailable. But the fact is, you know, there are there are so many of these weapons already in circulation. And, and uh, you know, as we see in Chicago, that, that you know, you, you, you don't find gun shops in Chicago. And, and yet many of the guns that, that are used to commit crimes there wind up being traced either to suburban gun shops or to gun shops in Indiana and, and, and you know, outside of Illinois. So, I mean, you know, you can, you can try to build a wall around Illinois with these, you know, with new gun restrictions. And, and clearly something needs to be done here because, you know, the, the idea that you can walk into a, you know, as we've seen people walking into supermarkets and schools and parades with, with these weapons and, and inflicting absolute warlike terror on people, something needs to happen. But um, it, 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 it's hard to imagine like how anything that anybody does in Washington or Springfield is going to stop this. And that's, that's the most, vexing part of the whole problem. Peter? Yeah, uh, to Dave's point, uh, I think we now have more guns in the United States than we have people. Um, and so there are so many guns out there in circulation, it is going to be very hard to clamp down on it. Um, and as you said, uh, you know, there's not that much of an appetite for it in Congress right now with a 50-50 Senate and a very slim Democratic majority in the house uh and so it's going to have to be decided at the ballot box i think and that's another reason why i think democrats in illinois want to make the conversation about this as close to the election as they can uh rather than inflation in the economy and speaking of the ballot box that's a nice segue over to the next topic you know despite the fact he's been playing down uh, any presidential aspirations on his part, there appears to be something of a groundswell of support for Governor J.B. Pritzker running for uh, the White House. It's uh, early to talk about this, or, well, or is it too early to be talking about this? Clearly, he's still got to get through the gubernatorial election in November. Well, Governor Pritzker has said he will not run for president if Joe Biden is running for re-election. Uh, so that's the big question. And Joe Biden is not going to come out now and say he's not running for re-election because that would essentially be the end of his, uh, his term in office. Um, nothing, he still has a lot of things on his agenda that he wants to accomplish. And if he were to announce that right now, then that would be the end of it. And all the attention would be focused on who's going to succeed him. Uh, so I don't think we're going to hear anything from President Biden for at least a year or so. Uh, and in the meantime, we have, you know, Democrats like J.B. Pritzker, who are kind of quietly maneuvering for position as kind of a just in case sort of scenario. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think, uh, you know, the, the 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 news peg for this, obviously, is the uh, July 16th appearance uh, where Pritzker is a keynote speaker in front of Florida Democrats, um, you know, and he, he, of course, earlier had gone to New Hampshire to speak to Democrats there. And those do seem to be like, you know, early, uh, early moves that, that, you know, aspiring presidential candidates make, um, you know, he's been very careful to, uh, um, you know, as, as Peter says, to make clear that he's not interested in running against Biden, he and Biden are friends. And, and so I think, uh, that statement is is ironclad up to the point that Joe Biden is president and, and seeks reelection. But, you know, that that statement has all sorts of wiggle room to it as well. You know, obviously, he he uh, he has the resources as a billionaire to run a, a pretty robust presidential campaign. Should he choose to, uh, he would he would be up against people like Gavin Newsom, the, the California governor, potentially, or the Michigan governor, Gretchen Whitmer. Uh, and, and those are just to name a few. I mean, it, it would be a, if, if Biden did not seek reelection, it would be a wide open field, similar, I think, to what we saw with Republicans in 2016, where there were just scads of them coming out of the woodwork. And so, you know, Pritzker, Pritzker has really upped his profile uh, in, in taking on, you know, taking on Trump being uh, out front nationally uh, on, on the, the Supreme Court's Roe versus Wade decision. The Highland Park mass shooting has elevated his prominence, uh, you know, and then plus, you know, who, who would have ever thought 
that we would reach a stage where Illinois would actually have a compelling story that might sell nationally in Illinois or, or in, in, in the country. Because like, you know, we have uh, uh, our, our finances here have stabilized. Uh, you know, he has managed to kind of keep the Democratic constituencies in Illinois, the progressives, the moderates, the, the you know, the uh, LGBTQ, the African-Americans. I mean, he keeps he's kept the, con, you know, the core constituencies pretty much together. And, and so uh, he's got a record he thinks that he can run on. Uh, starting with financial stability and, and uh, abortion rights and gun control. And so it'll be interesting to see how or if he makes the next move. It was interesting, Dave, you pointed out, uh, and, and Peter, that uh, Pritzker is going to uh, Florida uh, here in the coming days. That's already drawn the ire of his Republican opponent, uh, Senator Darren Bailey, who's basically saying, hey, you need to be here calling special sessions on gas prices and everything else and public safety. What are you doing running down to Florida? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it, you know, it's, it, it, it's a good counter argument, I, I think, for Bailey to make. I mean, Bailey, you know, Bailey is in a position where he, he's got to take advantage of as much free media as he can. And, and poking the governor on stuff like this is, is probably a, a smart political play to do. But, you know, on, on the flip side, you know, Darren Bailey, uh, it was not that long ago, I think it was in May, where he himself made a trip to Mar-a-Lago, the state of Florida, to, to curry favor with Donald Trump. So, you know, it's not unusual for people to be making trips to Florida for political reasons. Um, a spokeswoman for Pritzker's campaign says uh, this weekend's speech in Florida is a Democratic fundraiser. And it's all about the midterm elections. And that would uh, in some way, uh, I think, uh, lean toward uh, trying to bloody up uh, the Republicans uh, in what uh, up until now has been uh, seen as uh, a, uh, an election in the midterms uh, where there will be a lot of strong Republican headwinds for Democratic candidates. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, he's there. There are a number of races in Florida. I mean, they've got a governor's race. Uh, and, and of course, DeSantis is sort of the, you know, kind of uh, the, the, the ground zero conversation starter about the 2024 presidential election himself. Um, and, you know, there, there are all sorts of interesting subplots to the thing. You know, I mean, you think about uh, Pritzker's nemesis, Ken Griffin, the billionaire uh, hedge fund. Uh, operator out of Chicago, you know, he picks up his operation and his family and moves to Florida. And, and uh, you know, just it's kind of interesting, you know, if you could put those two together in a room in Tampa and watch them duke it out, you know. Um, and, and Bruce Rauner's down there, too. <laughs> Bruce Rauner's down there as well. Um, Peter, I, I want to go ahead. No, I was just going to say Ron DeSantis must be very happy that all these Illinois billionaires, Republicans are moving down to his state. Uh, we'll see whether or not he benefits from it. Uh, Peter, I, I do want to turn to one of uh, your bureau stories this week uh, on Pritzker's announcement. Uh, first of all, that we have a new IDPH uh, director in the Department of Public Health, Dr. Samir Vorha, who is a pediatrician and professor at the SIU School of Medicine. Um, his appointment uh, comes uh, on the heels of uh, Dr. Ngozi Ezeke's departure uh, a bit earlier in the year. Those are some big shoes to, feel, uh, to fill, particularly after uh, Dr. Ezeke's uh, performance over the long haul during the uh, uh, first two and a half, three years of the COVID pandemic. Yeah, uh, it is kind of interesting. I mean, this man has a medical degree, a law degree, and a public policy degree. Um, it, it, we were joking in the office that he must have just been a glutton for punishment when he was in college because those are three really uh, impressive degrees. Uh, and he does have some big shoes to fill. You know, uh, during 2000, uh, when the pandemic first hit, uh, Dr. Azike and Governor Pritzker had, I think, somewhere around 180 daily news conferences. Um, I mean, she was basically the face and the voice of the medical community in Illinois and of the public health community. Um, we're not, but we're now seeing, we're hoping at least that we're on the far side of the pandemic. Things are tapering off. And we've also seen Governor Pritzker ever so gradually rolling back a lot of the mandates uh, that he put in place during the pandemic, certain uh, testing and vaccine mandates, 
uh, things like that. Uh, it, he's hoping to kind of unwind this thing gradually, uh, hoping against hope that we don't have another surge this fall and winter. And, and that's concerning, the um, uh, point that you just made, Peter, because we're hearing now that the BA5 variant is extremely contagious and uh, it's already starting to make its uh, inroads into the population at large. Yeah, there's probably going to have to be a campaign uh, to increase vaccination rates and get people in for boosters, maybe even their second booster or third booster. Uh, this may be a disease sort of like the flu where you have to uh, tweak the vaccine every season or so because these new variants are coming along. Dave, what do you think? Well, yeah, I mean, I think he, I think he's going to have a new. Uh, it, 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 he's really kind of landing in the frying pan, really, because um, you know the, the what's concerning about this latest surge is the the fact that you know hospitalizations seem to be creeping up slightly, and mm -hmm. you know that's really kind of the barometer here we have to use about about you know how bad this is because you know with with so many people now relying upon home tests. You know, we, we're not getting an, as accurate of a reading on, you know, the spread of this as we were in the early days of the pandemic. So, you know, public health authorities are uh, watching this very, very closely. And it wouldn't surprise me if we, you know, if we take a neck, you know, another step in the next week or two going farther down, you know, I think Pritzker and, and, and the new public health director are going to be having to be front and center, uh, maybe not to the extent that they were before, but certainly, uh, you know, offering more public, you know, as Peter says, more public uh, health guidance to people about getting those vaccines. And, and you know, I know mask wearing is such a uh, politically divisive issue, but, you know, we may be edging ever closer back to that again uh, if, if things continue. Oh, you make a good point because in, in my hometown of Carbondale, I'm starting to see the mask mandates, at least in the stores, come back up in the windows before you walk in that they highly recommend that you wear those in addition to uh, the staff in the stores. Um, other topics I want to get to before we wrap up. Um, a little earlier, former Congressman uh, Dan Lipinski was toying with another run, uh, perhaps uh, this time as an independent. Now he says he's not running, but saying that he's eyeing a new, a new initiative to support independent candidates. And he says he's reaching out to Representative Adam Kinzinger about that. Is there room for an independent uh, party in Illinois? I mean, a few years back, uh, the Greens had a good run at that. They actually had a, uh, a candidate for governor on the, uh, on the ballot, uh, having uh, uh, wrapped up over 10% of uh, the vote. You know, I was um, eight years ago, I covered a U.S. Senate campaign in Kansas where an entrenched uh, incumbent Republican, Pat Roberts, was on the ropes and an independent candidate, a wealthy businessman named Greg Orman, drew a lot of national attention uh, by running against him. Greg Orman lost by nine points, even though he had been up in the polls before, because Republicans were able to pull in on election day or election week a massive get out the vote machine. They had caravans of vehicles that would drive people to the polls. 30 years ago this year, Ross Perot tried to launch the Reform Party, ran for president twice. 50 years ago, George Wallace ran for president on what was called the American Party. So this emerging independent movement that Dan Lipinski seems to refer to has been emerging most of my life and it doesn't seem to be moving very far. Uh, in a lot of cases, these independent movements tend to be more about individual candidates than they are about uh, voters who are feeling disaffected by the two parties. Uh, you know, it, in each of these cases, it was the same message. It, they talked about how neither of the two parties is representing you know, middle America or what Nixon used to refer to as the silent majority. Uh, but then these independent movements just don't go anywhere because they don't have the organizational strength. Uh, they don't have, you know, uh, 
political professionals in the background who do that kind of work year round. Uh, so he can talk about an independent movement. I just don't, I'm skeptical about it. I don't see it happening. Dave, Dave, your thoughts before we wrap up. I mean, really quickly here. I mean, both Lipinski and Kinzinger are kind of case studies in how their respective parties have kind of, uh, in a way, abandoned them because, um, you know, Lipinski was a, was a, uh, an anti-abortion Democrat and uh, Kinsinger, an anti-Trump Republican. And, and so the parties have been moving farther and farther to the to their extreme flanks. And people like uh, Lipinski and Kinsinger no longer have homes. So I can understand why Lipinski would want a place for independence to go. But, you know, until the, 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 the you know, until the resources are there and, and the, the votes are there, it's kind of a it, it's 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 a, a, a pie in the sky kind of idea, I think. Yeah, it, it, to your point, I think the question is what? How can you be more of most effective working within the parties to try and pull them back to the center, or trying to launch a third party? Uh, third party movements in the United States just have not gained traction, um, and you know I think they would be better off working within the Republican and Democratic parties to try and pull them back toward the middle. And Peter, Peter, you have the last word. Thank you so much. Our thanks to uh, Dave McKinney from WBEZ Chicago Public Radio and Peter Hancock of Capital News Illinois for taking part in this week's Capital View. Gentlemen, thanks so much. Take care.